Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Since the last time we've talked, the economic and political landscape has changed dramatically. By the time this video releases, it's going to be around a week since the Russian invasion of Ukraine and then the subsequent sanctions that were threatened before the invasion by US and Western allies and then the second round of more severe sanctions that came through a couple days ago to impede Russia's ability to finance the war as well as provide pressure on the Russian financial system. Well, today we're going to take a look and see whether or not we can make it into a nice digestible information dump what those sanctions are, what the impact is, as well as what I plan on doing and what I have done recently. So first and foremost, before we get started with the video, I do wanna share that anything that YouTube pays me for this video, I'm gonna donate it to the Red Cross to help with humanitarian efforts. There has been a million uh, refugees since the invasion began and the number's only gonna increase, so I wanna see if I can do my part. Around a week ago, like I said, a Russian invasion of Ukraine began with those 150,000 troops that have been stationed across the border in Crimea, the border of Ukraine, as well as Belarus. The war is still ongoing as we speak today. But at least from an economic standpoint, as well as a political standpoint as well, uh, you can see that the Western world, US and their Western allies have acted in pretty tight coordination to sanction Russian financial systems, as well as Russian people, uh, and provide military aid in terms of weapons and aircrafts to Ukraine. What we're just going to try to focus on is maybe the most important parts of the sanctions. I, I'll list it in the description below if you guys want to read it about all the sanctions that have been levied against all these people and all these banks and all like SWIFT and the central bank. But I'm going to try and break it down to three main segments. Number one, people. Number two, banks. Number three, central banks. Uh, the sanctions against people, really simple. It's Putin and the richest people in those sanctions are to, to hurt them economically, to maybe potentially provide them with incentive to turn against Putin or, or be less supportive of his government's actions. Number two are to Russian banks. My, when I was reading up on Russian banks and understanding and digesting this information, uh, the large, I think top four Russian banks hold like 50% of all the wealth and all the money in Russia, which means that it's very top heavy. Um, which is unlike what our American banking system is like. And so by, by sanctioning these Russian banks, you're actually hindering their ability to do business with Western financial institutions. However, the, the last one is what came over this earlier this week, where United States and the Western allies started sanctioning uh, the, Western, the Russian Central Bank. And I'll give you guys a quick background of what the Russian Central Bank is has in currency and currency reserves and what they could have done if they weren't sanctioned so essentially back in 2015 when uh, russia annexed crimea uh united states also sanctioned russia um inflation went up to 20 percent you know the russian economy was hit very very hard the russian government learned from then and so the russian central bank actually has a large currency reserve foreign currency reserve to help alleviate some of those pains I think Russia is 11th in GDP, but they have the fifth largest foreign currency reserve. And so some things that they could have done was provide liquidity to the market when the banks get sanctioned. And if the rubles were, ruble were to fall, then they can help prop up the ruble by buying, by buying rubles, right? Using, by selling off their currency reserves and buying ruble. And I thought this was really fascinating. So I'll share with, I'll go a little bit more into detail for this one just in particular, and then we'll, we'll go into what I think would actually impact the global market more. What you see on the screen is essentially how much money uh, the Russian central bank has. They have $630 million, billion or so in foreign currency reserves. What has happened is the US and the Western allies has sanctioned that war chest essentially, and has effectively rendered a portion of that chest useless. As you can see on the screen, this is from Statistica, if you see on the lower right hand corner, this is the breakdown of those $630 billion in reserves. 32.3% of it is in euros. 21.7% of it is actually in gold bars. 16% is in US dollars. 13% is in Chinese rian. And then 16.5% of it is in other currencies. And of those 16.5.5%, some of them is in Japanese yen. Where are these currencies or these gold bars located? 21% of it is in Russia, 13.8% of it is in China, 17.12.2% of it is in France, 10% uh, of it is in Pan, 
9.5% of it is in Germany and 6.6% of it is in the United States. And so effectively what's happened is by, by sanctioning the central bank, anything that's located within those countries that have sanctioned the central banks is basically frozen and any of those currencies that are in those in the currency of the respective countries that have sanctioned Russia is also basically useless. So in this case, for example, China has not yet sanctioned and probably will never sanction Russia. That 13.8% of the currency reserves in China will be usable, as well as other the 5% other institution, uh, international institutions, as well as the 13.1% of the yuan that is outside of these countries that have sanctioned the central bank. So effectively, what that has caused is a run up of the ruble. The ruble has dropped by 30% to an all-time low, and right now I think it's sitting at like 112 ruble to one US dollar. And it's forced the Russian government to really raise their interest rates as well to 20% to help figure out how to find additional funding from the international market, right? By raising interest rates, they're trying to, to make them seem more attractive to finance from. Um, but on the flip side, a lot of credit ratings has also cut the Russian government's bonds and uh, ratings. And so raising interest rates is also, I guess, probably the only way that they can finance um, and find some sort of cash since a lot of their cash reserves have been cut. And so how does that really impact the economy? I would say the first thing that we should really look at and the most, the one that I would think is probably top of mind for all of us is energy prices. Pulling up commodities from CNN business here, but you can see um, right now crude oil is at 113 bucks and it's really shot up from 93 to like 105 since the invasion started and now it's sitting at 113. Russia is one of the largest exporters of oil in the world. I think second, although Europe has not yet sanctioned energy related business, there has been a lot of, I would say speculation, but a lot of impact to the oil and gas industry, causing that commodity price to increase. And you can see that with natural gas as well. Another thing too is if you look at wheat prices, wheat prices will probably also shoot up as well. Ukraine and Russia are both two of the largest exporters of wheat in the world. And so by not by Ukraine being at war and Russia not being able to do business, uh, wheat prices, wheat supply is probably going to go down. And so wheat prices are going to go up. So speculatively speaking, wheat prices are, are going up as we speak. And on top of that, beyond just wheat and food, there, Russia is also a major exporter of rare minerals and metals that is important for manufacturing and product development. By limiting market access to palladium, aluminum, and nickel and other sources of rare metals, that could also drive supply chain constraints to further increase you know inflationary pressures since M russia is a heavy and a large exporter of these rare minerals in the world i think the biggest takeaway here is a lot at least directly for us in the u.s equities market the biggest impact is probably inflationary pressures right as the cost of energy and the cost of raw materials go up cost the cost of doing business will go up which means that uh, as you guys probably know gas prices will probably raise at some point. And if we're not able to get access to wheat or if we're not, or if the global market isn't able to get access to those rare minerals to produce the products that we want, like consumer electronics, then those prices will also go up because those rare materials will also go up. Essentially, I'm, I, I do think that one of the biggest impacts here is inflationary pressures on us. In an already constrained environment, further constraints doesn't bode well. If inflation does continue to rise, then I don't exactly know how the Fed will respond, right? I do think that, for example, on last Thursday or last Friday when the market went up, I, I think there was some positive news that the the Fed wouldn't be as hawkish in such an environment such as this. Um, but that remains to be seen because inflation if inflation runs rampant and runs hot, then who knows what the actual impact will be. So that's probably what I'm looking out for the most. Secondly, too, as well, from a geopolitical situation, um, since we since Europe hasn't cut off Russia from uh, energy exports and energy transfers because Europe is predominantly dependent on Russian gas and oil, that's also another huge point of contention. Uh, Russia could also always cut off Europeans, the European nations from Russian exports, energy exports, and that could be a huge ramification to European equities market as well as Russia's ability to finance war especially since oil and gas is so expensive nowadays. And then lastly, um, this probably isn't as talked about as often, is probably China. China is one of Russia's allies at the moment, right? They're still one of their trading partners and one of the currencies that they can transact in. And since they're banned from SWIFT, certain banks are banned from SWIFT, they can use the Chinese alternative to 
talk and transact. Um, on top of that, I do think that the geopolitical situation between China and Taiwan is, is one to keep an eye out on. Who knows if this will embolden the Chinese government to step up their efforts to reunite with Taiwan, but that is also a possibility that can further draw the world into a global conf conflict, potentially. And the last thing to point out, too, is in terms of what the world in is transitioning to, I do, I do see a continuation of self-reliance or a development of self-reliance. Germany, for the first time in decades, have increased their their military budget to arm themselves. I think European countries have understand that their energy dependence on other people and other countries is not a sustainable future going forward. And so I do believe that an increase in renewable energy investments and infrastructure investments and technology investments from US and the world in general to protect themselves and be more self-sufficient, maybe even a reduction in globalization would be a logical step. And you can kind of see that in certain stock prices that have gone up in the last couple of days as well. Let's take a look at the heat map here to kind of get an understanding of what's happened, at least today. Um, this is a heat map for Wednesday, March 2nd. And you can see the, the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, Russell's, most of them are up. Now, if you were to just go down to like the S&P 500 and look at what sectors there are, like tech is green, I, it's very green. With like M phase here going down, three, 3.93 percent uh netflix is down 1.61 percent overall it's been a strong positive uptrend uh, at least today over in the overall market um, even energy too which makes sense energy has been very very strong over the last couple of days the last couple of months actually and so this this trend here has continued same same thing with materials as well and utilities importantly let's take a look at just the overall market situation we'll take a look at uh, S&P 500 over the last couple days, we'll go down to daily chart. And I do believe that the invasion started on 224. And so the intraday swing on 224 was actually quite positive. And so ever since the war began, the S&P 500 has gone up around 30 points, which is close to 10%. It, was, it, it went to a low of 410 all the way up to where it currently sits at, at 437. As you can see, there, there are like significant volume that it came in on this day, 224, some on 225, and then 228, 229, and uh, March 1st. It's around, it's flat. And so I guess the market here is kind of, it's just digesting what's happening in, in the overall market. But we can also go to Dow Jones, but that's probably not as important, honestly speaking because it only has 30 stocks, but you can even see that same trend that's coming in. And we won't look at, uh, we can also look at NASDAQ, um, which is, and you can see that same pattern form on NASDAQ as well, where it formed a, a, a new low and a strong rejection off of that level into where it currently sits. Now, if you were, if I were to just look at it from a macro perspective and I don't have any biases and, and we like just forget everything we talked about earlier, the graph, honestly speaking, still doesn't look very good. Uh, it formed a new low here at 320, uh, and we can even go back out to a weekly chart. It formed a new low at 360, sorry, 320, 316, and it's now clearly in a downtrend, right? It went from a high to a low to a lower high and now to a lower low. And so there's a lot of downward pressures that's being shown in the market. And even though the market has been green and large intraday swings, from a larger perspective, it does seem that the market is still very bearish even in the short term. And you can see the same trend hold in all of the major indices. We can get rid of some of these lines here just for simplicity's sake. You can see that lower low on the wicks as well as the um, lower highs on the wicks down into these three weeks from a low to a high to a lower low, lower high to a lower low. And even on the on the weekly charts, lower wicks. And then the main the the, the main one here would potentially be this this week where it's hasn't formed a lower low, which is a good, which is good news. But honestly, it isn't saying much because the market is in such a downtrend recently. It's broken past that previous support, and I'm guessing it's found this new support here at 320. Now that we've gone through all of that, what does that mean for my overall investment portfolios, including my credit spread account? I know that this is predominantly a credit spread channel, 
at its core. And let me know if you guys want more content like this, but I feel like in events similar to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and COVID, for example, where there is a large shift in geopolitical and macroeconomic situations that we have to look at everything from a holistic point of view, stocks, bonds, you know, options, credit spreads, whatever it is, we have to kind of view your overall strategy and reevaluate whether or not we're setting ourselves up for success. And what is a top of mind for me is that there are just a ton of unknowns. On, on the screen right here, you'll see that there hasn't been that much of a downswing after war breaks out. However, I was bitten by that in the past too with COVID and certain and other situations where you know people compare COVID to like bird flu and they're like, hey, COVID's not gonna be a big deal. And lo and behold, you see what happened in February of 2020, the, the bottom fell of the stock market. So we, we kind of got to treat it as if it was its own entity and kind of evaluate whether or not we believe that the market is going to react positively and follow what has happened in the past or react negatively similar to what happened with COVID, right? And for me, there are just a lot of unknowns with how things are going to play out, especially with accordance to not only just the war in Ukraine, right? Can Ukraine hold out? Is Putin ever going to stop? And in my personal opinion, probably not. Are energy prices going to continue to rise? And if they do, then at what point will a barrel of oil get to? Will the supply constraints due to the war, like on wheat and raw minerals and raw materials, cause supply chain constraints to further be constrained and prices to continue to rise? And if that's the case, then how does that affect inflation in here in the States? I know the US equity market is one of the safest markets in the world. But if inflation, example, for example, is running rampant, then doesn't that mean the Fed have to somehow cool down inflation? You know, with all of these different variables pulling you left and right, will Powell and the Fed actually come through and, and be more hawkish? Or will they actually become more dovish? So many unknowns, especially with these new wrenches, right? We use, and so the market is going to have to figure this out. And from even from just a macro perspective, I'm looking at just, just the charts like we talked about. There's a lot of downward pressure. And I do, in my own personal opinion, uh, I do think that there's a lot more pain coming upcoming in the future. So we'll talk about stocks first. I've already started reallocating. I've been reallocating my cash over the last six to nine months into from less growth related stocks into more valued, like more value oriented stocks, similar to what Warren Buffett would do. Um, I've also recently over the last three months, transition a lot more money into more protective stocks, like for example, energy and necessities and, and defense. I've also taken a lot of my short-term gains from accounts, from my options trading accounts that have higher risk. I haven't done that yet in my credit spread account, um, honestly speaking, because that's just, that's to show you guys how credit spreads can be used as a tool and transition them into like more value oriented stocks like i've purchased a lot more of these big tech stocks as well in my because i feel like they're, they're very well positioned in this macroeconomic situation this is not really stocks related but i've, I've also bought some long-term put options just in case the bottom falls out and my thesis that i had in the past if you guys want to check out my 2022 investment strategies about shorting china that's still going on i still have shorts on china and i still have shorts a lot more shorts nowadays just in case uh, the downward pressure continues like we talked about earlier now finally we can get to the credit spread aspect of it for those of you who are new the credit spread account that i do share publicly that's a hundred percent of credit spreads and i would not recommend anyone do that because that is a lot of risk it is mainly to demonstrate how you can leverage credit spreads to as a tool to make a lot of money and as i subsequently showed you guys as well lose a lot of money however for that account over the last month and a half i basically traded only calls because the downward trend is downward. So I've only traded calls. And while I've been working on figuring out how to get rid of some of these contracts that I've had since like October, November of last year. And I'll share with you those results in another video about how like I leveraged my trading, my trading strategy to decide on selling calls. And I've also been experimenting on some new strategies on like really undervalued stocks that are well positioned. For example, like J&J. Honestly, there's a lot of volatility there. There's a lot of things that I'm trying to do. But the idea there again is to deleverage myself as much as possible and see whether or not we can deleverage the amount of risk that we can have even when we're trading credit spreads. And so that's about it. The world is crazier and crazier year after year. It's been insane. 2020 was COVID. 2021 was COVID and other things in 2022 was COVID plus like an invasion and a war. Like 
things are crazy, man. And it's, it's, it's exciting to be part of it in terms of a, an economic financial market perspective. But from overall like quality of life or overall like humanity perspective, it's not great. I um, just want to reiterate, if you guys stuck to the end and watched a lot of ads, thank you guys so much for paying for letting YouTube and Google pay me so that I can donate it to the Red Cross. Let me know if you guys have any questions. If you guys liked it, press the thumbs up button. If you guys loved it, please consider subscribing. Hope you guys learned something. I had a lot of fun making this video because I was trying to get an understanding of what the sanctions actually mean. And I learned a lot about Russia that I didn't think I would ever know. And stay safe in the market. The market is crazy. And until next time, peace.